my friends, I say this to you. Yes, things might have been worse. But on the other hand, remember that things might have been a whole lot better. Nation is invisible. Not permanent distance. Temperance. Purely temperance. We are the moon in Paris and London and Bayard. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, is remembered as the greatest of America's modern presidents. When he took office, the United States was more deeply troubled than at any time since the Civil War. He was elected to an unprecedented four terms. When he died in 1945, on the eve of victory in the Second World War, America was beyond dispute the supreme power in the world. Today, every schoolboy knows that it was FDR who offered the American people a new deal. Many people believe that it was the New Deal that ended the Great Depression in America by a policy of massive public spending financed by huge government deficits. Great construction projects like this hydroelectric power plant built by the Tennessee Valley Authority are taken as evidence that FDR pioneered what's called Keynesian strategy. That he overcame the Depression by public spending and so put America back to work. The other thing that people think they know about FDR is that he was the founder of what's called the Imperial Presidency. He's remembered as the first to establish the supremacy of the president over the other two branches of the American government, the Congress and the courts. These are the two images of FDR that have survived, the pioneer of Keynesian public spending and the Imperial President, making use of his popularity to ride roughshod over the constitutional balance between the branches of government. Each of these images unfortunately, owes as much to myth as to reality. To depict Roosevelt as the president who cured the Depression, sadly, is totally false. And while he did experiment with many tactics in his battle against the Depression, deficit spending was not one of them. Large-scale public construction projects like this had little overall significance for the economy. The reason for that is that they were financed not by deficits, but in the traditional way, with higher taxes. In 1939, six years after Roosevelt took office, nine million Americans were still unemployed. As for the claim that FDR was an imperial president, well, perhaps he'd have liked to be that. But it's also true that after his first year, he and his New Deal were repeatedly frustrated, reversed, stymied, and hamstrung by the Congress and the Supreme Court. Still, for all his frustrations and all his failures, Roosevelt's place in history is secure. He did break the traditional laissez-faire philosophy which forbade the federal government to take responsibility for the health of the economy. And he did preserve American democracy at a time when many Americans were afraid that it might crack under the strains of the Great Depression. In March 1933, the United States was a nation on the verge of collapse an awesome total of 12 million Americans, one out of every four workers, 
were unemployed. Most of those still working were on short time, and wage rates after repeated cuts were 25% lower than before the Depression began in 1929. Mass unemployment had totally overwhelmed the relief agencies of city and state governments, and the federal government had steadfastly refused to match the scale of the disaster that had struck American society. Before these men could have qualified for their miserable place in the soup line, they would first have had to sell off their valuables, such as the family car or the refrigerator. Their homes would have been repossessed by the mortgage company. On the farms, things were no better. The price of farm produce had plummeted. And the farmers were burdened by the heavy debts they'd contracted before the Depression began. Many farmers, unable to meet their mortgage payments, had their land repossessed by the bank or the finance company. Most catastrophic of all, perhaps, were the incessant waves of bank failures which struck everyone, rich and poor alike. By 1932, those fortunate enough not to have lost their life savings kept a constant eye on the news, ready to join the queue at their bank if another panic flared up. Of all the big cities, Detroit was worst hit. Chris Alston was an unemployed car worker. Something that, that sort of epitomizes it was was the, the fellow who sells an apple on the corner. We buy an apple, he sold an apple, a penny. Oh, that, uh, that little enterprise. The other was long lines of people who uh, every morning would go to the fashionable restaurants in the back of the fashionable restaurants. And the, the people who worked in the restaurants uh, were part of the morning conspiracy. The cans where they threw the what was uh, from that during that day, what was left on a plate were very clean cans, and the food was very clean food. They cleaned the cans nicely and they dumped it in there, and the people took it and ate it from there. But there's nothing wrong with it. It was cleaner than some people have on their tables right now. After three years of misery and despair, the American people looked to the new president as their only hope. Not since the days of Abraham Lincoln had the American people expected so much of one man. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born into a rich, aristocratic East Coast family. The young Franklin had all the advantages that money and position could provide. After graduating from Harvard University, he married at the age of 22 his cousin Eleanor. The bride was given away by another cousin, Theodore Roosevelt, who was at the time President of the United States. Franklin followed his cousin into politics, and in spite of being struck down at the age of 39 with polio, he went on to become, like his cousin before him, governor of the state of New York. Roosevelt's period as governor of New York, from his election in 1928 through the Depression years to 1932, gave him a rare understanding of the pain and the hardship that were being suffered by millions of people. It gave him to valuable political experience to try to alleviate that suffering. The economist John Kenneth Galbraith, who knew him well, said that FDR saw the United States as would a kindly and attentive landlord. No doubt the security he enjoyed here at the family's home, Hyde Park in New York State, and his family's wealth and connections account for the supreme assurance he exuded all his life. This background gave him the confidence that, though others had failed, he, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, could still triumph over the Depression. His political philosophy reflected a New England education that was both aristocratic and Puritan. It left him with a sense of the obligations of the individual towards society, and especially a sense of the responsibilities of those favored by birth to the less fortunate. Where most of his class dreaded government intervention in the economy, Roosevelt disagreed. When the free enterprise system seemed to be faltering, government, he believed, must intervene to restore it. 
I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will... Immediately after his inauguration, President Roosevelt got down to work. His first objective was to dispel the atmosphere of panic in the country as economic paralysis gripped state after state. That would give him a breathing space to carry out his long-term strategy for overcoming the Depression. So President Roosevelt, on his first full day in the White House, signed an order declaring a nationwide week-long bank holiday. The most pressing problem, he told a joint session of Congress, was the fresh wave of bank failures that had swept the country just before he took office. I come before you... Over 5,000 banks, a fifth of all the banks in America, had already closed their doors. Congress instantly passed an act giving him sweeping powers over the banking system. And he went on the radio to give the first of his relaxed, avuncular, fireside chats to his people. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends... I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. Having at least halted the banking panics, Roosevelt then set about carrying out his plan for curing the Depression. Before his election, he brought together an informal group of political scientists, lawyers and economists to advise him on what he ought now to do. This was the famous Brains Trust, whose leading lights were a group of professors from Columbia University. The political theorist Raymond Moley, the economist Rex Tugwell, and the lawyer Adolf Burley. The Brains Trust has all agreed that the root causes of the Great Depression were the structural changes in the American economy which had begun in the last century but were vastly accelerated in the 1920s. Technological breakthroughs and the development of mass production were making for bigger and bigger firms until, in the words of Brain Truster Adolf Burley, Nearly all the economy was controlled by a few hundred men through a handful of giant corporations. These big companies came to dominate the whole of the economy and were then able, between them, to keep prices high, wages low and profits flowing into their shareholders' pockets. However, the rapid increase in productivity in the 1920s made it increasingly difficult for the working class, with wages barely rising, to buy the goods that were flowing off the assembly line. The behavior of big business, said Roosevelt's advisors, had led to a crisis of supply outstripping demand. What had happened was that the big companies had all launched massive investment programs in the middle and later 1920s, resulting in an enormous increase in production by 1929. But since the wages of workers and farmers had scarcely risen at all, purchasing power didn't match the scale of production. Goods were left unsold, and the big firms ran into trouble. The Brains Trust told Roosevelt that the Great Depression had got worse and worse for two reasons. The first was financial. The excessive speculation and lending of the 1920s had saturated the economy with debts. By 1933, with prices 25% below the level of 1929, but with debt obligations fixed, many firms individuals and financial institutions were being forced into bankruptcy. The second reason for the severity of the Great Depression, said the Brains Trust, was that the big firms reacted to falling sales not by cutting prices, but by cutting production instead. By laying off thousands of workers, they only reduced purchasing power still more. To bring the giant corporations to heel, the Brains Trust and President Roosevelt created the National Recovery Administration, soon popularly known as the NRA. The idea behind the NRA was planning. Roosevelt was convinced that the unregulated competitive economy just wasn't working. Instead, there would have to be a new cooperative approach involving government, management and unions all working together. It was, of course, a sharp break with American political tradition. So much so that Roosevelt was soon accused in Congress and elsewhere of trying to turn himself into a dictator. He did his best to reassure people. Good. A few timid people who fear progress will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing. 
Sometimes they will call it fascism, and sometimes communism, and sometimes regimentation, and sometimes socialism. But in so doing, they are trying to make very complex and theoretical something that is really very simple and very practical. I believe in practical explanations and in practical policies. I believe that what... Under the NRA, the government would call together businessmen and trade unionists in each industry to write a code. In these codes, the businessmen would undertake to take on so many new workers and to increase wages by a certain percentage. In return, they'd be allowed to raise their prices, though not by as much as wages would go up. More jobs and higher pay would increase total purchasing power. Higher purchasing power meant higher sales. Higher sales meant higher profits. And that meant more investment and still more jobs. Robert Nathan was one of the architects of the NRA in 1933. We've always believed in a free enterprise system, which means a competitive system. And when businessmen get together and plan and program by industries, this is, in a rather considerable degree, incompatible with tough, vigorous competition and contrary to antitrust laws. But under the National Recovery Administration, this was permitted under the codes, and so it was a considerable difference from the past. Such a role for government was certainly not what the Founding Fathers had in mind back in the 18th century when they drew up the Constitution of the United States. They entrusted its preservation to the predecessors of the nine old men who sat on the Supreme Court. The court's job was to uphold the Constitution, and in so doing, to interpret its language. Nowhere in that language was there any warrant for such sweeping interference with the rights of private property, as Roosevelt under the NRA now proposed. The crucial issue was that of compulsion. The President's legal advisers warned him that if he compelled employers and employees to obey NRA orders, then the Supreme Court would hold that his entire recovery program was unconstitutional. If he chose a voluntary system, the court wouldn't interfere, so voluntary it was. The National Recovery Agency was obliged to rely on persuasion, not on compulsion. Roosevelt threw his immense popularity behind a massive publicity drive, aimed at persuading every firm in the country, from the corner grocery store to General Motors, to sign an NRA code of practice. Do I hear... Did I hear someone mention NRA? Even Hollywood came to the rescue, with Dick Powell leading the propaganda campaign. I didn't realize who you were. You see, I've just been writing a patriotic song. I must have fallen asleep. Don't excuse yourself, my boy. We've been watching you. In fact, I've been watching everything that has happened in this country for over 157 years. I've seen it grow from 13 states to the greatest and strongest country in the world. And now, through the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, it is striving forward to finer and better things. What can I do to help it out? You and 120 million other Americans can help by patronizing stores that display the Blue Eagle. Those stores are sharing to bring back prosperity. I suppose everybody is compelled to sign the NRA code. No. This is a gentleman's agreement. President Roosevelt is asking each to lend a helping hand for the common good. Oh, I see. As soon as everybody goes back to work, they have more money to spend, and that would increase business everywhere. Is that right? That's it, exactly. The more people buy, the more things the manufacturers will have to make, and the farmers will have to grow. And the road to better times will be open again. The road to better times. Open again. Open. Why, that's it. That's an idea for my song. Listen. There's a new day in view. There is gold in the blue. There is hope in the hearts of the world's on the way to a sunnier day, for the road is open again. There's a load of repairs, a song in the air, it's the music of this evening. Every flower is a flower of the happiness, and cause the road is open again. There's a good blue in the white of Thank you. 
Although the NRA was by far the most important part of the New Deal, FDR pushed a wide range of other legislation through a stunned Congress during his first hundred days. The New Deal brought to Washington dozens, if not hundreds, of young economists, lawyers, and other intellectuals. They were encouraged to develop their own ideas, however novel, radical, or mutually contradictory they might be. It was a period of feverish excitement, and it generated a welter of proposals, all of which FDR seemed to welcome with equal enthusiasm. There's a nice little story to illustrate his political style. The president is in his office one day, with his wife Eleanor sitting in a chair in the corner. The door opens, and the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, walks in and puts a proposal to the President. Roosevelt listens, thinks for a few moments, and says, Harold, you're perfectly right. Ickes leaves, and a few minutes later, the door opens again. This time, it's Ickes' bitter rival, Harry Hopkins, the Federal Relief Administrator. He proceeds to put exactly the opposite proposal to the President. Roosevelt listens, thinks for a few moments, and says, Harry, you're perfectly right. When he's left, Eleanor, looking puzzled, points out the contradiction between the two proposals. They can't both be right, she says. Roosevelt listens, thinks for a few moments, and says, Eleanor, you're perfectly right. Roosevelt was a politician of genius. He loved to juggle with conflicting advice, apparently willing to try anything. He took many promising ideas and pushed them through Congress give relief to the poor, to lend money to homeowners unable to meet the payments on their mortgages, to throw a lifeline to farmers by setting a minimum price for their produce, or to lend money to companies that were struggling with debt. These were all important measures. They all helped to contrast Roosevelt and the New Deal with the don't-get-involved attitude of his predecessor, Herbert Hoover. But it was on the NRA that Roosevelt relied to end the Depression. It didn't take very long before NRA was seen to have failed. Although wages rose by about 15% in the first two months after NRA was created, and employment went up by 2 million, the increased demand didn't lead to greater production. Higher demand appeared, but businessmen didn't step up their production or their investment. They simply put up their prices. This brought the anticipated cycle of recovery to an abrupt end. Once business picked up, businessmen wanted to revise the codes in their own favor. They had the votes on the code boards, and they used them to revise prices, giving themselves higher profits without taking on more workers. Unions, more often than not, settled for higher wages and didn't insist on more jobs. The president had been warned by brains trusters like Rex Tugwell that unless government had the power to fix prices, the NRA wouldn't work the system of economic planning would have to be compulsory. Unless its decisions had the force of law behind them, they wouldn't be obeyed. But as we've seen, the lawyers warned the president that the Supreme Court would strike down any compulsory regulation of prices as unconstitutional. It was this fear of the Supreme Court that drove Roosevelt to rely on a voluntary recovery plan. And because it was voluntary, employers were able to prevent it working as it was meant to work. In the spring of 1934, a year after Roosevelt took the oath as president, over 10 million Americans were still out of work. Five million were dependent on public relief. The number of vagrants thumbing and bumming their way around the continent was now estimated at a million. The National Recovery Program had itself broken down, and the high hopes created by Roosevelt's election had broken down with it. had now had three years in which to appraise these agencies of national planning. They are no longer in the Aurora Borealis stage with all its excitement and false promises of light. We emerge today from the illusion into the daylight of practical experience. As the euphoria surrounding Roosevelt's election evaporated, opposition started to grow. As well as former President Hoover, some fellow Democrats spoke out against Roosevelt's radical policies. Big business, of course, was solidly mobilized against him. A few young economists inside the Roosevelt administration realized that the NRA had failed 
because of its voluntary nature. They argued for a fundamental shift in economic policy. They'd been influenced by the writing of John Maynard Keynes, and they called on Roosevelt to embark on big public spending projects, like the dams in the Tennessee Valley. They wanted to create jobs and to finance this program with massive deficits. They thought that through this Keynesian public spending, unemployment could soon be eliminated. Such public spending as Roosevelt had already authorized was not Keynesian, for it had been financed by increased taxes and not by government deficits. Lachlan Curry, who was head of research at the Federal Reserve, roughly America's equivalent to the Bank of England, tried in vain to persuade Roosevelt to spend his way out of the Depression. He, his initial approach to economics was that of the of an individual rather than a nation. And he uh, was a victim at the, initially of the fallacy of composition. That is what is true of the individual must be true of all individuals. And uh, if an individual spends more than his income, he goes broke. Therefore, if a nation spends more than income, it goes broke. And uh, it took quite a while to convince him that you couldn't apply private accounting to the nation. And uh, this was the fallacy of composition that Keynes talked about way back in the 20s. But, um, and there are many people still subject to it. The New Deal had aroused expectations and then failed to satisfy them. The result, from 1934 on, was growing labor unrest. New legislation had given the trade unions the right to organize and protected them for the first time from judicial intimidation. But when the unions tried to exercise their new rights, they ran into stiff resistance. The workers tried collective bargaining through their unions. When that was frustrated, there were strikes. Taxi drivers in New York, miners in Montana, truck drivers in Minneapolis, electrical workers in Ohio, textile workers in North Carolina. There were ugly, violent clashes. In several cases, strikers were shot dead by the police. One of the most important of these angry confrontations broke out on the West Coast in San Francisco in July 1934. Labor relations between the San Francisco ship owners and the longshoremen had long festered in acrimony and distrust. Each morning, the dockers would gather on the waterfront and offer themselves for hire to unload whatever ships were waiting by the dockside. The ship owners hired and fired this casual labor as it was needed, and it was the bosses who dictated the term. They operated a blacklist, which denied work to anyone they considered to be an agitator or a threat to the system. Blacklisted or surplus labor was simply turned away each morning. When the NRA legislation was passed, the longshoremen, seeing it as their chance to get on even terms with the employers, formed a local branch of their union and demanded recognition. But in the spring of 1934, the ship owners refused point blank to recognize the union. Negotiations broke down, and in May, the longshoremen went on strike. The strike leader was an Australian who'd worked in San Francisco since 1920, Harry Bridges. Well, the port, in effect, was closed down as far as cargo movement off the docks, we can say. Uh, the steamship companies and the steamer-owning companies were unloading the ships and the, the cargo stayed on the docks. So, as a result, with the, car, the ship, the, the, the harbor being full of ships, uh, all the docks were full of cargo, and there was no more place to put cargo as it was unloaded off the ships by strike breakers. So, that, so we got down there on July the 3rd and picketed, and we called upon support from all workers of the, the, the city, of other unions, to come down and help us, and they replied by the hundreds and the thousands. So they had a mass of workers strung along the whole waterfront to stop, to, to, to try to hold up the, the hauling in of, of uh, teams to haul the cargo out. And they're all centered on one of the docks there, Pier 38, at, on July the 3rd. And there was a big battle at Pier 38 because the teams went in and came out. And that's when we first had the real clash with the police. 
And that led to a real battle where the police opened up not only with tear gas guns, but, but uh, rifles. And that's when we had two men killed, shot down, and, and a couple hundred wounded. And that is when the, the mayor of San Francisco at the time, because the situation was out of control, he said he called upon the governor of the state to call out the National Guard, and the National Guard, that's the state soldiers, were called out and occupied the waterfront. When the National Guard uh, occupied the waterfront and declared in effect to have strike illegal and, and to stop picketing, why that, that was a kind of an effect against the whole labor movement. So the only one way, we had a discussion amongst ourselves, I was the chairman of the strike committee, where the, 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 my own people thought, well, it's time, we're lick, we have to go back to where we said, oh no, we'll see, we'll go to the other unions and call for a general strike. So we started to go around all the other unions and we got all the other units to vote to call a general strike, which took place on, I think, July the 12th of 1934. All workers walked out and shut everything down, streetcars and everything, uh, various business in the city of San Francisco. After four days, the strike collapsed. In the end, the strikers did win recognition of their union, and most of their other demands were conceded. But before it was over, the strike did reveal a degree of class conflict and class consciousness that was not supposed to exist in America. Local politicians were alarmed. They dispatched telegrams to Roosevelt, here at the White House in Washington, with reports of full-blooded Red Revolution. Everybody demanded, Roosevelt said later, that I sail into San Francisco Bay, all flags flying, and end the strike. They went completely off the handle. FDR could brush aside calls for troops to quell the strike. He refused to panic and waited for his federal mediators to bring both sides to a compromise. But when that succeeded, he was still not complacent. He knew that his failure to end the depression had produced even more ominous stirrings elsewhere in America. And at this Congress, there was a unanimity of opinion and of demand on the part of the laborer, the farmer, the Veterans Organization, the National Union for Social Justice, and other organizations, demanding that Congress restore and recapture for itself the privilege, the sovereign right to coin and regulate the value of our money. For at the bottom of this depression, it's a money question. At the bottom of Father the Charles Coughlin of Detroit built up an enormous radio audience with his weekly broadcasts on issues of the day. The Bible made it clear, he told the country, that the bankers' manipulation of finance had caused the Depression. By 1934, when the New Deal was faltering, he denounced Roosevelt as the banker's pawn and called for the formation of a new radical third party. Because it will not be possible to say to the idle workman who is seeking employment, if you have no bread, we'll feed your cake. That breeds a revolution. The man Father Coughlin looked to, to lead a radical third party, was a young senator from Louisiana, Huey P. Long. Long was an extraordinary character, even by the standards of the Deep South. Elected governor of Louisiana in 1928, at the age of 35, he was a southern populist. He spoke for the poor and especially for the poor, angry white farmers of the backcountry. He outraged the plantation aristocracy and the oil companies who ruled the state. Long's program was the most radical ever seen in the South. He built thousands of miles of roads for the benefit of the farmers. He modernized the educational system. He expanded state hospitals. He built a new airport and a new state capitol building. 
He financed this program with taxes on the rich and the corporations, earning him the hatred of conservatives in Louisiana. I was elected railroad commissioner of Louisiana in 1918, and they tried to impeach me in 1920. <laughs> when they failed to impeach me in 1920, they indicted him in 1921. His country boy's style disguised a cunning mind and political ruthlessness which soon crushed all political opposition. I to become governor in 1928. And they impeached me in 1929. <laughs> in 1932, he moved on to the U.S. Senate, the next step in his strategy to become president. All right, how long do you want me to talk? Oh, Lord God, how can a man be vigorous in 150 words? In 1934, he decided to run against Roosevelt because the New Deal had failed. Long was determined to do for America what he'd already done for Louisiana. He launched a Share Our Wealth Society, which he argued posed a genuine threat to the rich. One million more men are unemployed than when I left here. The Dole has five more million people on it. The big men have had greater incomes, the little men have had lesser incomes. And now we find that our good president says to all of us that all the theories and nostrums have failed to work, just as I said, just as I said then, that they wouldn't work. We must have a redistribution of wealth. No man must be allowed to have too much. No man must be allowed to have too little. Unless you limit the size of the big, it necessarily means that the small people must become more and more impoverished as time goes on. I propose to urge at this Congress that we limit the size of the big man's fortune and guarantee something to the balance of the people. That's more than 150. Long's attacks on Roosevelt grew increasingly sharp through 1934. The growing support for his Share Our Wealth movement reflected Roosevelt's failure. This was the campaign song. King, every girl the queen, or you can be a millionaire. But there's something belonging to others. There's enough for all people to share. When it's sunny June and December too, or in the winter time or spring, there'll be peace without end. Every neighbor a friend with every man a king. Thank you. Thank you. Huey Long posed a genuine danger to Roosevelt in 1935, as Thomas Corcoran, one of Roosevelt's most important advisers, recalls. Long had a chance to do this at least. He had a chance to take enough votes away from Roosevelt in an election to let a Republican win in 1936. If Long had lived, that might have happened. And everybody in the Democratic Party knew it. And everybody in the Democratic Party was frightened of it. On top of these worries, Roosevelt now ran into conflict with the Supreme Court, which in May 1935 finally gave a ruling which struck down several vital planks of the New Deal. Of all the court's decisions, the most disastrous for FDR was the verdict that the entire National Recovery Administration was unconstitutional. The Constitution only empowered the federal government to regulate interstate commerce. The NRA, said the court, was an attempt to regulate all commerce. But the court's chief justice, Charles Evans Hughes, then went on to define interstate commerce so narrowly as to make it clear that the court didn't want any part of NRA. The Supreme Court's decision came as a heavy blow to Roosevelt. He was left on the brink of a presidential campaign, facing an electorate that was deeply disillusioned with his performance, and yet, without any program for economic recovery that was acceptable to the courts. At this point, Roosevelt decided there was no time to devise any alternative recovery program before the election. Instead, he decided to concentrate on the humbler objective of getting himself re-elected. Then, once he was securely back in power for a further four years, he could turn his attention to making the Supreme Court more amenable to his way of thinking. Roosevelt now performed what would today be called a complete U-turn. 
He abandoned the idea of planning, and with it, any hope of curing the depression by 1936. The brains trusters gradually faded from the scene. To compensate for the lack of policy, Roosevelt turned up the flow of rhetoric. He now seized every opportunity to pin the blame for depression on monopolies, Wall Street, and the bankers. To consolidate the support generated by this attack on big business, the president next moved to outflank his populist opponents. He was able to push a number of policies through Congress in 1935, because many of the Democrats, who formed the majority in the Congress, were also facing re-election in 1936, and they thought that Roosevelt's various reforms would reflect well on them. In announcing the 1935 reforms, Roosevelt implicitly recognized that he'd abandoned hope of ending the Depression. However, unemployment remains a serious problem here as in every other nation. And it is because of this that we've come to recognize the possibility and the necessity of certain helpful remedial measures. These measures are of two kinds. The first is to make provisions intended to relieve, to minimize, and to prevent future unemployment. The second is to establish the practical means to help those who are unemployed in the present emergency. Our social security legislation is an attempt to answer the first of these questions, and our work relief program, the second. <laughs> The Social Security Act introduced old age pensions and unemployment insurance. Benefit payments and work relief programs diffused some of the bitterness of the unemployed, weakening the appeal of radical left-wing groups like the Communists. The Banking Act provoked long and well-publicized wrangles with leading bankers, which made Roosevelt, rather than Father Coughlin, appear to be the nation's leading crusader against Wall Street. And the Tax Act, which raised income and inheritance taxes on the rich, made the president the champion of the poor. Then, on the 8th of September, the president had what could only be called an unexpected piece of good luck. Huey Long, at the height of his popularity, was assassinated by a madman, a relative of an anti-Long politician. After Long's death, Roosevelt's support in the Democratic South was secure, and the South formed the first pillar of what was to prove a winning electoral coalition. The second pillar was the Democratic organizations in the big cities. President Roosevelt's crusade on behalf of the poor, manifested not least in relief payments, was something worth voting for. The third pillar was the farming community. In the past, it had voted Republican, but it had been won over by generous New Deal farm supports, at last convinced that an East Coast politician could care for the farmer. Lastly, there was the industrial trade union movement. Their loyalty was won by the progressive policy on trade union law and on minimum wages, inaugurated by the NRA and championed by Roosevelt in his struggle with the Supreme Court. We are fighting fighting to save a great and precious form of government for ourselves and for the world. And so I accept the commission you have tendered me. I join with you. I am enlisted for the duration of the war. The election result was a political earthquake. Roosevelt won every state but two. The Electoral College divided 523 to Roosevelt to only eight for the Republican, Alf Landon. It was the biggest popular majority in American history. In his wake, Roosevelt brought 334 Democrats to the House of Representatives against only 89 Republicans. The new Senate 
had 75 Democrats and 17 Republicans. Armed with a fresh mandate from the American people, Roosevelt, the champion of the underprivileged, was determined to alter the balance between rich and poor. He planned to introduce a national minimum wage, to build public housing, to increase financial aid to the farmers. The main obstacle Roosevelt faced to his reform program was the Supreme Court, which had already thrown out the NRA. His fear now, in 1937, was that it would also throw out his more modest proposals like the national minimum wage. The problem for Roosevelt was that the court's justices were appointed for life. So he came up with a plan to bend the court to his way of thinking. What is my proposal? It is simply this. Whenever a judge or justice of any federal court has reached the age of 70 and does not avail himself of the opportunity to retire on a pension, a new member shall be appointed by the president then in office with the approval, as required by the Constitution, of the Senate of the United States. It is charged that I wish to place on the bench spineless puppets who would disregard the law and would decide specific cases as I wish them to be decided. I make this answer, that no president fit for his office would appoint and no Senate of honorable men fit for their office would confirm that kind of appointees to the Supreme Court of the United States. Congress voted down. They returned the bill, out of, they, they put before the bill out of committee. I was there the night they did it. I was out with Joe Kennedy's house with the president. They simply, simply, simply refused it for him. But up to that time, we had been trying desperately to get some kind of a face-saving compromise. And we thought we had a two-judge compromise. And for that, we had a leader called Robinson of Arkansas. And we didn't get it through because Robinson died. And the minute that Robinson died, the Congress, particularly under the leadership of Ghana, re refused, turned the bill to committee and refused to have anything to do with it. Even if Senator Robinson had lived, Congress would have thrown the bill out. It gave the president far too much power. In 1935 and 1936, the president had a hold over Democratic congressmen. It wasn't the appeal of the New Deal. It was the congressman's need for some credible platform to fight the 1936 election. Once they'd fought that election and won it, the president lost his hold. Over the next three years, from 1937 to 1939, Congress was far less amenable. It defeated or substantially amended a whole series of important presidential proposals on minimum wages, on increased relief spending, on farm relief, on public housing, and on the reorganization of the government. Even more ominously, Congress barred Roosevelt's efforts to help Republican Spain in 1937 and Czechoslovakia in 1939. And it blocked his efforts to give help to Britain during the first year of the Second World War. Two graphic images of Roosevelt have come down to us from the 1930s. The first is the inspiring picture of the confident, debonair patrician lambasting the vested interests on Wall Street and in Washington, the economic royalists, as he called them, on behalf of the forgotten man. Both those who liked what he did and those who hated it thought that Roosevelt had fundamentally altered the balance of powers in the American system. The founding fathers designed a system of checks and balances because they wanted to prevent any future president behaving like a king. Did Roosevelt destroy these checks and balances and create an imperial presidency? Not really. The Supreme Court had the power to prevent Roosevelt bringing in the compulsory planning he needed to end the Depression. And when the president tried to act in an imperial way with the court, he ran into the worst defeat of his political career. The Great Depression lasted from 1929 until 1941, when the United States entered the war after Pearl Harbor. It was first the war orders for American industry after the war began in Europe in 1939, and then the war itself that put America back to work. It was, as Roosevelt himself said, Dr. Win the War, 
not Dr. New Deal, who got the patient back on his feet. All this is true, yet the Roosevelt years were a watershed in American history. When he took office in 1933, the economic system of the country was on the verge of collapse. The future of capitalism itself was in the balance. No one had any doubt that if the economic system truly collapsed, then sooner or later the political system would have collapsed too. Roosevelt's own closest collaborators made it plain over and over again that they knew just how high the stakes were. If they couldn't end mass unemployment and get the country back to work, then there would be a revolution, either of the left or of the right. Roosevelt didn't cure the depression, but the depression did come to an end. And his New Deal legislation did permanently change life for future generations of Americans. The new social security system put a safety net for the first time under the old, the sick, the unemployed, and the poor. The banking and financial reforms went a long way towards eliminating corruption in the stock market and protected investors against the banking panics that had ruined them. The new labor legislation strengthened trade unions in their negotiations with employers. The New Deal brought lasting prosperity for the American farmer. The combined effect of all these economic and social reforms was not negligible. Together, they eased the hardship of the Depression. They defused the bitterness against the system. And so, not least, they saved capitalism in America. And by doing that, they also saved democracy. Well, I think President Roosevelt and his administration uh, will have a, an important and constructive and uh, revered role in the history of this country, despite the fact that many groups didn't like him, especially the vested interest groups. But I think he introduced a whole new concept of government responsibility, and it, it's a change in philosophy, the, almost revolutionary in nature, that will give him this place in history. But I'd like to emphasize that this was done without government ownership without regimentation, and those who talk about socialism and, and, and use terms about Roosevelt because they didn't like the intervention, I think exaggerate, because it was done remarkably with, with modest uh, government intervention and not real government control and regimentation and ownership. I think he stands as the greatest amongst them all. Because he dared to do uh, what none of them would do. He created a revolution in America. Of He organized the labor so that they could fight the capitalists and hold them in check. When he set up uh, the uh, Labor Relations Act and all those, and he created the revolution. He created the union, brought the unions back into power so that they would raise hell to ho hold the, the capitalists in check. And then he, he said to the capitalists, look, if you just keep yourself straight for a little while, I'll, I'll not only give you what you want, but I'll give you more than what you want. But you got this whole fast. You can't have it so that you have your cake and eat it, too. And all this time, labor was creating itself. And he, he, established, he uh, established laws to allow them to, to create this turbulence and this revolution. And that's what saved the country. In my book, he stops. And, and in books, I know that if, after all... No president ever won four terms. And the only reason why he won four terms is because the people loved that man. Not only that man, they loved the things that he stood for. They loved that New Deal program that gave them that security, the things that we wanted, that righted the economy as much as we, it could be possible. We knew we had a man there that would listen to the people, and that's what we want.